God. You know what we have to do. So. <laughs> Remember, when you hear that voice, you're going to drop everything. <laughs> so, I know you're hanging on to a lot of things like me. We're going to let go of them, folks. Let us get in that mood. <clears throat> Soon, we will drop everything Amen. and go up to be with our Savior, to Him be all glory. Amen. Today, as our brother mentioned, the enemy is active. Well, circumstances, the Lord is allowing that to test us. We have many families that are missing, but uh, praise God, we pray for them, those who are sick, those who are traveling. We have several who are not here, but thank God the Lord blessed us with the Andraos family today. We thank God for them, for Michael and Layla and their son. Let's give the Lord a round of applause for bringing them in our midst. And we thank God for each and every one of you. Thank God for the trumpet, the shofar. I think this is a sound we better accustom our ears to because, boy, folks, it may be sounding any time. Get ready. Fine-tune your ears because the Lord is on his way indeed. And uh, uh, just a quick announcement that what events are coming up, Many of you have received probably an email from me yesterday. Did you receive an email? Somebody did. Whoever opened their email. I don't open my email often. My wife teaches me to do it all the time on her phone. I still haven't gotten that habit. But when you do, and if you haven't, uh, you're invited to a, a big event coming up the 30th of this month on a Friday. We are taking uh, a big part of uh, a hometown buffet in Downey and we're going to be gathered and we're going to be hosting a dear brother who we met through our missionary, a missionary that went from here to serve with him. We were shocked when I heard his name, Pastor Muhammad. And I told her, are you sure there's a Pastor Muhammad? So I asked about him, turned out that he has a very vibrant ministry in the city of Tyre, which is amazing. Uh, yes, his life is in danger all the time, but he believes that when God wants to take him, he will take him. Nobody can take him sooner than that. So Pastor Muhammad is very bold, very vocal. I saw his ministry on uh, uh, his YouTube uh, testimony, uh, Muhammad Yamut. You can check him out on YouTube. So he'll be with us for three days. And uh, on Friday, uh, he will be hosted by Al Karma TV in the morning. In the evening, we will be at 6 o'clock uh, at uh, a Hometown Buffet in Downey. The address will be sent to each one of you. You're invited. Invite other people. Come and let's enjoy that, uh, that event. It is part of the SoCal Christian Medical, but we're having it uh, uh, to, to, to expose as many people to the grace of God that is saving now and launching into ministry Muhammad's and Ali's and Hussein. It's about time that God says, yes, I can break those walls and I can send those people bolder than ever before. Also, we're going to be restarting our Wednesday meetings, which we have put on hold during the summer. They will be starting next week. We will start actually with a movie. Uh, that's right. There was a mention about science and faith. Well, guess what? The Moody Bible Institute came up with a beautiful movie. I came across it. And it shows beyond the shadow of any doubt the scientific evidence. That's right. You're going to see it. The scientific evidence of the unseen spiritual world. It's amazing. I was very blessed by that movie. You're invited to come and watch it Wednesday at 7 p.m. Uh, Friday, thank God, the prayer meeting is ongoing. Everybody is invited Friday morning at 6.30. And then to follow at 7.30, discipleship meeting. We have still two more sessions to finish through discipleship. And there will be a group of people who graduate right here in our midst. So come and catch up with us if you like. And of course, Sunday, 11 o'clock, we pray for the repairs that are still ongoing. Hopefully they will fix uh, uh, for us, the Indonesian church, the, the bathrooms, etc. We pray for all that, but let nothing distract us or hinder us. Be it repairs, be it sickness, be it whatever that God says, come and put me first and I'll take care of the rest. And those who do that will experience the grace of God that is sufficient in every circumstance. I'd like to invite you to stand up if you don't mind. And I'd like to read with you that segment again. Matthew chapter 6, verses 6 to 18. A segment that is known to all of us. It was read before us. I'd like to read it one more time. Let us all read it, that it may dawn on us what God is calling us to do as a church, as his people. 
Let's read together. But you, when you pray, go into your inner room, close your door, and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you are praying, do not use meaningless repetition as the Gentiles do, for they suppose that they will be heard for their many words. So do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Verse 9. Pray then in this way, Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors and do not lead us into temptation but deliver us from evil for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And verse 14, for if you forgive others for their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. 15, but if you do not forgive others, then your Father will not forgive your transgressions. 16, whenever you fast, do not put on a gloomy face as the hypocrites do, for they neglect their appearance so that they will be noticed by men when they're fasting. Truly I say to you, they have their reward in full. 17, but you, when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face. 18, so that your fasting will not be noticed by men, but by your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Let's bow our heads one more time before the Lord. Father, please address us individually, as a group. We need to hear your voice. We beg you, Lord. Eliminate every hindrance, every chaos, every human-centered thought in our minds this morning, we beg you. Let only your person be in our mind this morning, Lord, so that we may focus on your voice. We heed it. We rejoice in obeying it. Conform us into the image of your Son, we beg you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Please sit down. In a letter written to his barber, who asked Martin Luther, he was a new convert at the hands of Martin Luther, he said, what is the greatest activity I can do as a Christian? And Martin Luther rightfully answered, pray. Martin Luther said, let prayer be the first activity you do in the morning and the last activity you do in the evening. I think that was a very good lesson given to a new Christian. It's a good lesson for all of us. Someone wrote and said, prayer is the key for the morning and the bolt of the evening. A day hemmed in prayer is less likely to be unraveled. Listen. Satan is concerned when we pray. Satan cares less if we have Bible studies. That's right. Satan cares less if we come to church. Satan cares less if we go out and talk about Jesus. As someone said, Satan trembles when he sees the weakest Christian on his knees. There's nothing that Satan hates and dreads than a Christian who's praying. And yet, that's what we've been called to do. Adoniram Judson, the first missionary from the United States to Burma, wrote and said, I have never prayed for anything in my life except it came to pass one way or another. God always answers prayers. Prayer delights God's ear, it melts his heart, and it opens his hand. There's nothing that moves God more than prayer. Someone wrote and said, when life knocks you to your knees, you are in a very good position. Go ahead and pray. Take advantage when difficulties come 
and pray. If we want to accomplish anything that will have eternal value in our life, we need to pray. If we want to be like Daniel, we need to pray like Daniel. Daniel would rather go to the den of lions than miss a day of prayer. We all want to be doing great things for God. I want to tell you the pathway has been already given to us. It is called through prayer. And uh, my purpose today is not to take in detail our segment, our text that we read but I'd like to give a general overview and I'd like to try to answer three questions before you this morning about prayer what where and why so first I'd like to begin with you by answering this first question and I pray that the Holy Spirit will come here today and help each and everyone understand what is prayer and why we should love it. I hope this will be your prayer. I hope it is your prayer already. Lord, help me to understand what is prayer and help me to love prayer. How many people say amen to that? Raise your hand. Amen. 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 May it be given to each one of us to understand what is prayer. That's the first question I'd like to answer before you. What is prayer? Notice the Lord, as he says in... Uh, Verse 7, he says, he tells them what is not prayer. So to tell them how to pray, he said, don't pray this way, but pray the other way. What is not prayer, he said, but when you are praying, do not use meaningless repetition. Don't do that. Don't just babble words automatically like the heathen, like the Gentiles do. God is not after robots. We memorize sometimes a prayer, Ta -ta -ta -ta. We say, it. God is not after that. He doesn't care about this. That's not prayer. But in the verses that followed, until verse 18, he conveyed to them that prayer is opening your heart to God. God is after your heart. And if there is a good definition, I read it, of our prayer is the following. Pray, prayer is intentionally conveying a message to God. I repeat, prayer is intentionally conveying a message to God. Why do I say intentionally? Because there are many times when we don't even say words, but somehow it is prayers. As we read in Romans chapter 8 and verse 26, it says, Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. Many times our prayers are words, but sometimes we don't have words. We're just groaning on the inside. And God calls it prayer. God is looking at your heart. And he wants you to convey a message to him intentionally, that you mean it. And... Uh, and uh, why don't I just say that prayer is conveying a message without intentionally? Because sometimes people indirectly are conveying messages to God. People unintentionally are conveying message to God that God doesn't exist. God is not important in my life. God is irrelevant. These are messages, but these are not prayer. Prayer is when you intentionally convey a message to God. It can be one of five things. You can, for example, be asking God for help for something. That's good. That's prayer. And God delights when you ask him for something. God delights when we, his children, come and say, help me. Matthew 7, 7, a famous verse says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock, it will be open to you. It doesn't say it may. It doesn't say perhaps. God wants us to come. And ask for help. That's a form of conveying intentionally a message to God. Or you can praise God for his nature. Marvel at him. Uh, uh, describe him. Uh, express an adoration to him. That's also prayer. The psalmist in Psalm 145 verses 2 and 3 says, Every day I will bless you. 
I will praise your name forever and ever. Verse 3. Great is the Lord, highly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. This is another way to pray. You convey a message to God about his nature, to his greatness. And then, or you can thank him. This is a prayer to give thanks to God. Thank him for his gifts. Revelation chapter 11, verse 17 says, We give you thanks, O Lord God. We give you thanks. The Almighty who are and who were because you have taken your great power and have begun to reign. We want to thank you for what you're doing in our lives. And then another message you can convey to God, you confess your sins. That's prayer. You confess your sins. The psalmist says in Psalm 32 verse 5, he says, I acknowledged my sin to you. And my iniquity I did not hide. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And you forgave the guilt of my sin. And last, finally, you can complain to God in prayer. That's right, complain. I didn't make that up. It's in the Bible. It says in Psalm 142, verses 1 and 2, it says, I cry out to the Lord with my voice. With my voice to the Lord, I make my supplication. Verse 2. I pour out my, would you read it? Complaint. My complaint to him. That's right. Before I declare my trouble before him. You say to me, but aren't we supposed not to complain? I tell you, it's not the greatest prayer to complain, but it's better to be honest and complain than be a hypocrite who says, I don't want to complain where you are bitter and sore and angry on the inside. Amen. Open your heart to God. Amen. Prayer is opening your heart to God conveying intentionally a message to him you can be asking for help you can be thanking him for something he's done for you you can be praising him for who he is you can confess your sins and you can be also complaining to him that's right God wants you to open your heart and convey a message to him that's what God wants us Christians to do that's what I would like you to do that's what I recommend that you do. The end of this year is coming and the following year, let every day of this coming days ahead of us be days of prayer. Let it be prayer all the time before we begin something and at the end of anything we do. Let us pray before every TV show. That's right. We need to pray before every TV show. Every car ride. Every phone call, every conversation, every shower, every night's rest, every meal, anywhere, anytime, let us be people who pray, conveying our hearts, longings to God in everything. That's what prayer is all about. Let prayer be to us like breathing. This is what prayer is. It is part of our life. That's what God is calling us, folks. If we want to have an eternal value to our lives, we need to be people who are in the habit of praying. And then secondly, where should we pray? Where should we pray? Look, it says in verse 5, let's go back to verse 5 before it. It says, it says, when you pray, you are not to be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners, so that they may be seen by men. Truly, I say to you, they have their reward in full. Verse 6, but when you, when you pray, go into your inner room, close your door, and pray to your father who is in secret, and your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Folks, brothers and sisters, Jesus Christ is telling us to appoint a place for us called the place of prayer. I know in our house, we used to call it the prayer room until my mother-in-law moved and she lived with us for a few years. We lost the prayer room, so we had a prayer corner. And then when she went to be with the Lord, we came back to the prayer room. We have a room called the prayer room. When we're in prayer, I, I drag my son, I drag my daughter. I drag, Come, let's go to the prayer room. And then we have a prayer corner in the living room. We call it the prayer corner. It's nice to appoint a place in your house, in your home, called the prayer place. That's where I pray. You go to it and you say, I'm going to pray. Make a habit. I want to ask you, do you have such place? And if you do, are you using it regularly? 
are using. Make use of that place. Make use of that place that you will be someone who prays. And if you're living with a family, you say, oh, we don't have much of water, pray with your family. In fact, we should be praying as families. Look, Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7, says, Husbands, likewise, dwell with them with understanding, with your wives in an understanding way, as with someone weaker since she is a woman, and show her honor as a fellow heir of the grace of life so that your prayers will not be hindered. You know, unhindered prayer is the barometer that tells you if you're living a graceful life at home. If there's no graceful life at home, there will be no prayers. And I want to tell you, if there are no prayers at home, if the children don't watch mom and dad praying together, why would they should ever pray themselves? In fact, I think if children don't watch their, their family, their, their mother and father praying, chances are they will never pray themselves. Pray alone. And secondly, pray also in small gatherings. Let there be small gatherings of prayer. These are mighty, powerful gatherings called the prayer meetings. Matthew chapter 18, verse 19 and 20, familiar verses to all of us. It says, again, I say to you, the Lord Jesus says, if two of you agree on earth about anything that they may ask, it shall be done for them by my Father who is in heaven. And the verse that is all familiar to all of us, for where two or three are gathered in my name, there I shall be in their midst. Can you imagine the power? If two of you agree on earth about anything, it shall be given to them by my Father who is in heaven. There is a great power in gatherings, in praying with another Christian. Do you have such a Christian you pray with? Have you found that Christian you call him or her my prayer partner? I want to tell you, you're missing out on a great powerhouse for you and a great joy for you if you don't have such person. I say even today, plan on having such a person. I don't know, you may meet her or meet him on the phone, pray on the phone, pray on, I don't know, Facebook nowadays, pray on text, pray on with something, pray with someone, come to a prayer meeting. Because I want to tell you, there's nothing more powerful than Christians when they get together to pray. Of course, pray alone, but pray also with another Christian. When Peter and John were arrested by the Sanhedrin and taken and threatened and told never again to open their mouth. I'm going to tell you what they did. They went to their small prayer group immediately and said, we need to pray. In Acts chapter 4 and verse 29 to 31, it says that they went there and they began praying. And look what God did when they prayed. They said, now Lord, look at their threats and grant to your servants that they may speak your word with all confidence. Verse 30. While you extend your hand to heal and signs and wonders take place through the name of your holy servant Jesus. Verse 31. And when they had prayed, look, look what God did. The place where they had gathered together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God with boldness. These are people who were threatened. They should have been afraid to lock themselves inside and indoor and say we should stop. Instead, when they prayed, God shook the earth, said, Folks, I'm in control of everything. You go out. And he filled them with the Holy Spirit. And they go, went out in boldness. I want to tell you, I tell you, there is power when we pray. When the children of God pray, things are changed. I want to tell you, the world is moved. The nations are changed. The church is empowered. Divorced people come back and reunited. Children get saved. Things happen when we pray. And we need to pray because it's a great thing to pray. To pray alone, to pray in small groups, and to pray in the worship service. That's right, in the worship service. When you come here on Sunday, consider it, it's a meeting that is all surrounded by prayer. You see the songs that we're singing, the hymns that we're singing? They're all prayers. Come, Lord Jesus when the trumpet call, glorious are you, etc. 
center your mind on them when you're singing them, mean them, and make them your prayers. And when the word of God is said, read and, and expounded before you, ask the Lord that this word will affect you and will change you and will make you conform to the image of his son, the Lord Jesus. Let this meeting be centered and surrounded and, and immersed in prayer. This is a time of prayer, of crying to the Lord for help, of seeking the Lord. Cry like Peter when he was about to drown. Lord, save me. Cry like the father of the epileptic son. Uh, epileptic son. He said, Lord, believe. I believe, but increase my faith. I need more faith. I come here to pray. Let prayer be something we do alone all the time. Let prayer be something we do in small gatherings, in small groups, and let prayer be the centerpiece of this worship meeting. This is, this is where we're supposed to pray. Everywhere, throughout this year, every day, anytime, and everywhere. And last, and I close with that, the third question I'd like to answer before you is why should we pray? Why? Somebody once asked me, he said, but doesn't God know already and he has all their determined things? I want to tell you why we should pray. To begin with, we pray because God commanded us to pray. That's right. He commanded us. He says in, uh, in Matthew 6 verse 9, he says, he said, pray then in this way. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. I want you to pray. God has commanded us to pray. Not to pray is sheer rebellion. People say, do I have to pray? You have to. This is a command from God. We are commanded to pray. James 5.16 says, confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another. You see, this is another command. If you tell me how many commands throughout the Bible is pray, pray. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 17, it says, Pray without ceasing. Luke 6, 28. I'm going to list them very fast, a few of them. Luke 6, 28, it says, Bless those who curse you and pray for those who mistreat you. Luke 18, verse 1. Then he spoke a parable to them that men perhaps ought to pray and not lose heart. And then Luke 22, 40, it says, When he came to the place to Gethsemane, he said to them, pray that you may not enter into temptation. And so on, and so on, and so on. Pray, pray, pray. God is sending command after another. I want you to pray. We need to pray because God has commanded us to pray. And then we need to pray because prayer is designed to increase our joy. Did you know that there's joy in prayer? I want to ask my brothers who attend the prayer meeting on every Friday. I want to tell you, we come out from that prayer meeting, we come frowning. By the way, we come early in the morning like we missed some sleep, etc. And I want to tell you, every single time, we come out vibrant, joyful, bouncing with joy. I want to tell you, you're missing out on a big joy if you don't come to a prayer meeting. Prayers were not supposed meant to make you unhappy. Prayer was meant by God to make us more joyful. He would say, going to a prayer meeting? That's right. You should be rejoicing. I'm coming to increase my joy. The Lord Jesus says in John 16, 24, it says, Until now, you have not asked nothing in my name. John chapter 16, verse 24. Until now, you have asked nothing in my name. Ask, and you will receive that you what? Joy. Would you say it again? Joy. That you what? Joy. That your joy may be full. You want fullness of joy? People say, I'm not very happy nowadays. I want to tell you, perhaps you're not praying enough. Yeah. I'm kind of sad. I'm kind of depressed. Have you tried prayer? Have you tried the joy of prayer? The joy that comes to you when you pray. And then we pray also because prayer is our greatest power and privilege. You know, God had ordained to make our prayers real causes for real events. Listen to James chapter 4 verse 2. James says in chapter 4 verse 2, You lust and do not have, so you commit murder. You are envious. You cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. Listen to the last part. You do not have because you do not what? Ask. If you want to have, you have to ask. 
In other words, things happen if prayers happen. And things do not happen if prayers do not happen. You want to see things happen in your life? You need to pray. And the reason things are not happening in your life is because you don't pray. That's right. It says, this is our greatest privilege and our greatest power. It is utter foolishness not to pray. He would say, I don't want to pray. <laughs> you're a fool. You're, you don't understand what you're missing. You don't understand how weak you're going to be, how helpless you're going to be. And it is greatest wisdom to say, I want to pray. Those who say, I want to dedicate myself to prayer are the wisest people. And they reap the benefits all along. I want to tell you, if missions happen, if the church progresses, if salvation takes place, it is always after prayers. Let me tell you a little story. In 1722, Count Nicholas von Zinzendorf, I'm sure I've spoken about him before, troubled by the suffering of Christians exiles from Moravia, he invited them to his big property in Germany and uh, he gathered them in a place known as Hern Hut, which means under the Lord's watch. It grew quickly and those poor Moravian Christians who were persecuted came and they started praying. And a prayer meeting begun over there in August 27, 1727. It was not long after that, that that prayer meeting was planted by 24 men, 24 women who said, we will take turns one hour, there will be someone. One person at least praying. And then the other person will come and supply him. 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And it continued like that. Only six months after that prayer meeting that started on a daily basis. As they started feeling and sensing the feel they should go out and reach people all over the world. And sure enough, the beginning of missions as we know it begun after that meeting. Of course... Western missions, modern missions began with William Carey later on. But the beginning, the real beginning of missions happened after that prayer meeting. And they started going from place to place. Many of them perished. But I want to tell you, it was the golden era of the Moravian missions during those first two years. 22 missionaries perished and two more were imprisoned. But others took their place in all 70 Moravian missionaries flowed from the 600 inhabitants of Hernhut, something unparalleled in all mission history that out of 600 people only gathered, 70 missionaries will go all over the world to live all over the world. By the time William Carey, who was the father of modern mission, came, over 300 Moravian missionaries had already gone to the ends of the earth. And that's not all. Do you know who was responsible for the conversion of John and Charles Wesley? It was the Moravians in London because they were having a meeting, a prayer meeting in London. And that sparked the revival that swept throughout England, throughout Europe, bringing hundreds and millions to the Lord. It was because of that prayer meeting. Folks, if we want to have something with eternal impact, we need to dedicate ourselves and say, I'm going to start praying from here on. And I think it would be wise people to do that. Now look, William Carey himself. William Carey, he went to India. As you know, he was the father of modern, modern mission in 1793. And he was there alone after such prayer meetings for him. Nobody wanted to go with him. In fact, his wife didn't want to go. He dragged her with him. And there he had three kids. Two of them were saved. And the third one was unsaved, giving his father a lot of pain. He wrote a letter to his church in England saying, I have one son, he doesn't want to come to the Lord, he doesn't want to do missions, he doesn't want to proclaim the gospel, he's given us a lot of pain. His name was Jabez. And one of the pastors at the church, he read the letter and he started weeping. He said, folks, our dear brother William Carey is having a hard time. His son Jabez is not coming to the Lord. And he said, congregation, I'd like you to all stand up 
And let us all with one voice, one mind, lift up this supplication to God that Jabez will be saved. It wasn't long after a letter came from William Carey said, my son Jabez suddenly got saved and he wants to go on missions. And they asked what time this happened. It coincided the same moment as the congregation lifted their voice together with one mind and one voice. I want to tell you great things happened. William Carroll wrote a letter and said, this is for the glory of God that Jabez got saved, that my son finally came to know the Lord. The Lord is glorified when salvation comes because ultimately prayer aims at glorifying God. You know, that's what the Lord says in, in, uh, in verse 9, in Matthew 6, 9. He says, uh, but pray then in this way, our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name ultimately when we pray salvation happens but the glory comes to God and we need to be people who put God first the, the Lord says in John 14 13 he says and whatever you ask in my name that I will do that the Father may be glorified in the Son John chapter 14 verse 13 whatever you ask in my name that I will do that the Father may be glorified and the psalmist put it this way. I'm, I know most of you know that Psalm, God's 911, it says in Psalm 50, verse 15, call upon me in the day of trouble. I will rescue you and you will what? You will glorify me. Matthew 6, 9 tells us that the centerpiece of our prayer should be that his name be hallowed. I want to explain to you what hallowed be thy name means. Hallowed be thy name is that your name will be elevated above every name. That in our hearts, there will be no other name that will match your name. That our minds will be opened, that the scales of our eyes will be removed, that we will see that God is all in all. We sh should be praying and asking God, God, let your name be magnified in our hearts. Save people for your glory. Do things for your glory. So that your name will be the greatest name above all names. That will be people who will love you more. That will obey you more. Will trust you more. And will be conformed to the image of your son, the Lord Jesus. And we want to do this for your glory, Lord. And God is glad to answer that prayer at that time. He says, that was my design. I have conformed you. And we do all this when we pray. When we pray, I want to tell you, those who pray are the wisest, the happiest, and the most effective Christian of all. If we want to make an impact and not just live a life that is wobbly to and fro, not knowing where we go, we need to be people determined to pray. We need to say with the psalmist in Psalm 109 verse 4, I will give myself to prayer. If we do that, we're guaranteed victory we're guaranteed that god will accomplish his purposes in our lives beyond our imagination in return for my love but i am in prayer i give myself to prayer i will be from here on a person known for prayer and this is what being born again means being born again means that god becomes first in your heart and you begin wanting to communicate with with him if you're not praying, chances are either you're a rebellious child of God or you're not a child of God at all. I think the real thermometer of our Christianity, of our spirituality, is our life of prayer. Those who are praying are the real obedient Christians, and those who are not are questionable Christians or not Christians at all. May God help us. And I'd like to tell you that it hit me when I read the story of the son of William Carey, how he got saved, that we as a congregation, we don't apply that often. I brought a box at the end. It's called prayer request box, and it has cards like this. I'd like for each one of you, keep it, keep it there, Nancy. I'd like for each one of you at the end of this service to go there. If you have a prayer request, you'd like us in, a, in this church to pray for you, put it down. If you want it to be like private, say it's private, don't ever mention it. 
If you don't want it private, if I don't see the word private, we can talk about it, especially when the prayer gets answered. You have a son who's not saved. You have a daughter who's not saved. You have a wife who is not walking with the Lord. You have a husband who's not being nice to you, wife. You have an issue. You have matters. Write them. Let's come and pray for these alone, but let's pray for these also as a congregation. And God is going to be glorified in our midst to see salvation happen and to see glorious things take place in our lives. I'd like to invite you all to stand up if you don't mind. In closing, and in obedience to God, let us bow our heads before the Lord. And I want you to take like a couple moments of silent prayers. Let each one of us right now bring before the Lord matters that are important to you. Be it people in your family, children, be it relatives, be it husband, be it wife, be it issues of work, be it friends that don't know him, be it whatever issue, health matters, financial matters, bring those issues to the Lord in a silent manner. I'll give it like a couple of minutes. And at the end, we will all close in a prayer. But let's, let it be silent, two minutes, that will make a difference in our lives, in the lives of people around us. Go ahead.